So let's continue on. We're going to talk about the theory part of evolution, which means that it is an idea. We often call it a phenomenon in science that has tons of data to support this idea. Nobody at the current time and technology can disprove this idea. Now remember, evolution has two parts. It has the hypothet hypothetical part, how life was started. We don't have data, we don't have information to show this is how life started. There's hypothetical ideas, which we'll get to, about how life may have started. But this part of evolution that we're gonna talk about now and what you were working on in lab on Tuesday, all of those different fossils are ways to support that living things change over time. So what is evolution? This is a theory. So theory, principle, um, um, what's the other one? Theory, principle, and uh, shoot, there's three of them in science that we use that are pretty much all mean the same thing that are like, we have tons of data to support this. A lot of scientists have come together, tons of data, and no, hypothesis is like like a guess. Which one? A guess, yeah, right, yeah. A law, that's it, thank you, law, law. Theory, principle, law are the three things that all mean the same thing. Um, so if you see those in science, it means that there's a lot of data from a lot of scientists that support this idea, and no one during no one with the current technology can disprove this idea. Okay, so theory in terms of evolution means that we can see through fossils that living things are modified or change over time. And when we're talking about time, remember we're talking long periods of time, not overnight. I can't just like will myself to sprout wings, right? I can't make myself evolve. I've only got what's in my DNA that codes for how I can look, act, and how I am internally in terms of my physiology. Living things come from pre-existing organisms or pre-existing living things. And we talked about one of the principles or the postulates of Darwin and Wallace was that you can only exist in the genetics you get from your parents Living things go from simple to complex. So a lot of this is all, again, when we talk about descended, we're talking about this is based in genetics and what's passed from parent to offspring. Changes in the proportion of characteristics or genes will depend on the environment. Natural selection. Nature selects for those with the most beneficial traits. Changes over time happen from generation to generation. What makes evolution take such a long time is most organisms that, like at least we are seeing physically, are have long generation times. So from making the parents to making the offspring to the offspring growing so that they can reproduce there's usually gaps of time. And so what we have a lot of data about are organisms that are long generation times. Now, again, if we're talking about bacteria, for example, they have a generation time of 20 minutes, so their evolution is a lot faster than something like a human. All right, so again, what is a theory? I call this a fact because anything that is a theory may in the future, if technology changes, it may be disproved. So really nothing is a fact. It's every, nothing is a fact. Everything's kind of like a fact right now, but maybe it'll change. So like the idea of living things and where they came from, we still, we don't have a theory about that. We may get it to be a theory, but we just have ideas or hypotheses about it. Technology changes and then maybe we learn something different. For the part of evolution that says that living things change over time based on what is favored in their environment is the theory portion of evolution. There is tons of evidence 
you are being exposed to that evidence in lab. You're looking at different kinds of evidence to support that living, living things are modified or change over time. So you looked at some fossils the other day. You are maybe, and then you looked at skulls in terms of that. You looked at limbs. You're going to look at the embryos. I know some of you started that. We'll talk a little bit about biogeography, how living things change based on the movement of the tectonic plates or the movement of the continents. And then we're going to talk about a little bit about molecular biology, how looking at and sequencing DNA or proteins has helped us to see where things have come from. All right, so fossils. We're going to look at, this is called Archaeopteryx. Archaeopteryx is a transition animal between birds and reptiles. It has some bird traits and it has some reptile traits. Like, for example, it's got that beaky, the beak looking face. You can see these like little bits of feather remnants, imprints of feathers. But Archaeopteryx shows also some scales, which are more reptilian. And you can even see that with chickens, chicken feet are scaly. That shows that they had a relationship with reptiles at some point. And so what, like more current in terms of looking at what where birds fit into the grand scheme of things is that dinosaurs, there were some like bird-like dinosaurs and some reptile-looking dinosaurs. And we know they have a, a close relationship because we can look at birds and see some of the reptile traits in them still. Fossils are embedded in the earth and so they're kind of in rocks. You can see this looks like a rock with a fossil in it. You have people who, archeologists who will look for those and try and figure out the pieces of the evolutionary puzzle. Fossils can show us a progression of organisms over time. So all of the fossils that you looked at in terms of the limbs, we can see that with reptiles, I mean with With vertebrates, any of us in the animal kingdom who have a spinal cord, we call them vertebrates, that the vertebrates all have a similar forearm structure, the front limb. There's a humerus on the thumb side, there's a radius, there's an ulna, there's carpals, metacarpals, and phalanges. And we see that through the vertebrates. So there was some kind of original vertebrate common ancestor that eventually went into different environments because they were born, and we'll talk about mutations. Any difference in the forelimb is due to mutations. Does that mean a mutation is necessarily bad? If a bird has wings as a forearm and we have arms, are either of those bad things? No, right? So mutations are not bad things necessarily, and we'll get to that too. Sometimes they're bad. A lot of times they're good. Well, actually, a lot of times they don't do anything, and sometimes they're good. So we often focus on mutations are bad things, but sometimes they're good because, like, for example, if from the common ancestor in this population, so you have a whole group of them, and some of them are born with mutations that are starting to pop out like little wing structures, and they start being able to fly, they might leave the area of the population because they're better suited to flying. And some of them, maybe like their forearms, they were every, able to have claws and they were really strong. And so they could climb into trees and get away from a crowded population. So they were more favored to live here. 
or some were more favored, they were a different color, maybe more green, and they could hide in grasses. And some of them were just better swimmers. And so over time, those mutations have caused population, uh, individuals from the original population of the common vertebrate ancestor to go off and live in places where they and their mutations were better suited for their survival. Another thing about fossils is that oftentimes we might think of fossils as the actual like bones inside, but there's other fossils that we can take a look at and get an idea of what something like this particular dinosaur looks like. So in an area where they may have found a lot of bones of this dinosaur, the other thing that archeologists are going to look at is they're going to look for, oh, here's an imprint of a footprint. So that even though this is kind of in terms of comparing these two as small, it did have a lot of fleshy material around those bones that were pretty big. Oh, this is what, look at these bumps. This must have been what the skin looked like. They might find poop. And when they dissect this poop, they might find what was it eating? So it gives an idea of maybe like what the face looked like, what kind of jaw it might have, depending on what it was eating. Remember we talked about the finches last time, that their jaws were dependent on what the food was and vice versa. And then eggs, what, how did they reproduce? If they found egg remnants too. So all of these things, what archeologists do is they create hypothetical pictures of what something looks like. So if you go to the field museum and you see dinosaurs like this, that might change depending on if they find new information. Definitely the coloration is a guess. So you might have seen like, uh, let's say a T-Rex when you were younger, it was always this color and now it's kind of changing to this color. It's because maybe they found more information about the skin, maybe some DNA in the skin that showed it had certain pigments. Um, so it just depends on what they find and how it gets updated. So a lot of times the kind of fleshy portion of a dinosaur, for example, is a guess. It's a, hypo a hypothesis. Also, they try and figure out how old was this thing based on, if they can't get DNA, like old DNA from inside of the bones, for example, they'll go by like where it existed in layers of earth. And so that they can tell based on some like things like carbon dating, for example, that this layer was this old. And, and just in general, they can tell like by the different layers of earth, because earth will pile on top of itself, is that this is older than this, and this is the youngest. So let's talk about comparative anatomy. We have a lot of different parts of what we call comparative comparing anatomy, the physical features of an organism. Again, I can't sprout wings. If I just am like, I really want to fly like a bird, I can't just be like, boop, and will that to happen. I've only got the DNA that codes for what I can be, potentially. So you're going to look at a bunch of skulls today. A few things about humans from going from modern day humans to our relatives, the apes, we have a common, so this is a misconception. Like my parents would say, I don't believe in evolution because I don't believe we're a monkey. I'm like, well, we, we're not. <laughs> we had a common ancestor, but we were never a monkey. And they were like, oh, huh. So there's a lot of misconceptions out there when people just make up things or they hear things and we didn't evolve from a monkey, we didn't evolve from a gorilla, we had a common ancestor, a common ancestor. Then mutations happened and the gorillas went off and lived their life where they were best suited and the humans went off and lived their life where they were best suited. So features in terms of, we're gonna, of course, because we're just so egocentric, we're gonna look at humans and in lab, you're gonna compare more in terms of humans, ancient features that we don't retain anymore to what we have today. 
And so a big exaggeration between the common ancestor of the human and the gorilla, there's a lot of, again, like exaggerations in what that common ancestor a long, long time ago had that we've now changed to have quite a different skull structure. So a few things. Our teeth are much smaller. Did any of you get up this morning and run outside and you found a squirrel and you chased it down and you were like, <laughs> I'm gonna hope no. We don't have the teeth to do that. We can't just rip off the head of some organism in general. Um, because we have, we have like these teeth that are just more for chomping, cutting up our food and feeding it. Whereas they might need to pierce something that they catch. We have a lot of molars for crushing plant material. And then our front teeth are thinner for tearing. So big differences in our tooth structure and you can definitely see in the front. Uh, jaw size. The size of our jaw is smaller because again, we're not like ripping our food open. Much bigger, stronger jaw. Look at how much real estate just the mouth takes on the gorilla. And I mean that, look at how much size the jaw is. Our jaw is a lot smaller. I mean, our, our mouth, our jaw is a lot smaller as well. We have kind of a flat face. Over time, our face has gotten flatter because our snout, we don't need to have big giant teeth and a big giant jaw. So we've gotten this like reduced part of our face. So we have kind of a flat face. It comes out like a little bit, but in comparison to the gorilla, if the gorilla, you know, you can see that they've got this eye protection, a big brow ridge, we don't really have that, right? Because you're, again, you're not like tearing into your food and worried about things getting in your eyes. So we don't have, we have like a teeny little brow ridge, but not much, like a little one. They have a big brow ridge that sticks out and a big snout that sticks out. Our face has become flat. One thing that I do want to, sorry, focus on in addition to the, you can see the brow ridge of different species a little bit bigger, bigger. The size of the brain has changed significantly from our common ancestor with the gorilla. This is a human brain in comparison to a gorilla brain. We have a much bigger brain. So as we have evolved to modern humans, the brain size has gotten bigger. Does it mean we're smarter? I don't know. Well, as an anthropologist, you said that um, they found like strong evidence that um, race size was linked to uh, social um, ties. Like a race is three times the size of a chimpanzee, whereas chimpanzees have maybe 50 social relationships, whereas humans had uh, more than 150 social relationships. So they probably just like were more social beings and then that's why they came in. Yeah, great. Thank you for that. Thanks for adding that. I also heard that it's it's less of just um, an organism's brain size by itself, but also like it, it, it has to do, I think, more with like brain size and proportion of body size. Mm -hmm. So like, for example, the smartest dinosaur is actually called Judon. It was a tiny little dinosaur with a small brain, but in proportion to its body, it actually, the brain is very large. Oh, that's very interesting. Thank yeah. you for adding that too. And you can see too, if we go back here, Look at the amount of, I like to call real estate, meaning size, location. We have a, like our skull is mostly brain. The gorilla skull is mostly jaw and snout. So kind of interesting when you look at organisms to be like, oh yeah, look at that. And that proportion, our brain, you can even see just proportionally to the size of the entire skull, our brain is huge. And same with the proportion of our body. So limbs, we're just gonna review a bit of limbs. You already looked at them in lab, so this will be familiar to you, but I'm gonna add um, some extra vocabulary words to what you were looking at. The more related organisms are, the more characteristics they will share. Kinda makes sense, right? 
So when we're looking at vertebrates, for example, all of those that have a spinal cord share a lot of features that are similar, like the spinal cord itself, and then also the forelimb, but the forelimb was modified to what best suits those populations or groups in their environment. Homologous structures. This term, we're gonna see this a lot in biology. H-O-M-O, -O. it means similar. So when you're talking about like, for example, the application of people who are homosexual, date someone in similar sex to themselves, as opposed to someone who's heterosexual, they date someone who is not similar in sex to themselves. And so just like kind of those two applications, we use that so much in biology. Homologous chromosomes has that in there, homo sapiens. So we use this term as similar to show these two things are very similar to one another. When we're looking at the forelimbs, the forelimbs of vertebrates are homologous structures because we have a similar bone structure, humerus, the radius and ulna, the carpals, the metacarpals and the phalanges. Even though the bones themselves and how they look are different depending on the environment that the shape of those bones is favored in, we all do have the same forelimb structure. You also, a lot of you noticed that with the frog, for example, the frog's radius and ulna were fused and it was like two bones. You could see like a division, but it was two bones together. And because frogs jump a lot and they're putting a lot of weight and pressure on their forelimbs, these need to be stronger. So mutation in the frogs that started to have the forelimb, uh, the radius and ulna fused together, that was a better adaptation for them. You also may have noticed with the bats had really thin bones and even that they did not have both a radius and an ulna. With bats, because they're flying and they need to be light and weight, the ulna has started to evolve away. There's been mutations where it's been favored to not have an ulna. So they only have a radius, so they're lighter. And one of the, one of the bat, uh, some of the, I mean, one of the arms of the bat had no ulna and one had just like a tiny, it looked like almost a hair coming out. And that's like what's left over of the ulna over evolutionary time. When we're talking about homologous structures, these are structures that show that everybody who has these particular structures have a common ancestor. So they are more closely evolutionarily related than things that don't have the structure. Like for example, the vertebrates whom have a vertebrae and have similar bone structures are more related together than invertebrates who do not have a backbone or the forelimb structure. So again, we went through the forelimbs. The other thing about just thinking about the forelimbs is that the material the bones are made of are similar in structure as well. But again, we see over time, the different groups, maybe things happen where birds and bats, they have more holes or pores within their bones, which allows those bones to be lighter so they can get themselves off the ground, right? You could have really strong arms and you could flap your front arms as hard as you want, but will you lift off the ground? No, you're, we're heavy. Our bones are heavy, our muscles are heavy, our organs are heavy. Uh, sorry, and then they show what's called divergent evolution. They're going away from the same characteristics as the common ancestor. So just like gorillas and humans, there was a common ancestor, but we're both moving away from the characteristics of that common ancestor because we've gone into different environments where our mutations are more favored for each group's survival. So divergent means they're going away. So here you can see the bat. This is an example of a species. There's many different species of bats. 
But this one, the ulna, it's not even connected at the carpals anymore, which means it's getting favored to have less bone weight in them. Also the bird, um, when you all were looking at the bird, you were like, where is the difference between the metacarpals and the phalanges, right? Because they don't grasp anything, they have a wing. So the metacarpals and the phalanges, it's very kind of confusing where they almost look like it's like, well, I was like, pick, pick kind of a place where you're like, uh, the end is the phalanges and the middle part is the metacarpal. But we definitely can see, one of the things that we do see is you see the carpals where there's a bend in the forelimb, where the forelimb is able to bend. So carpals, carpals, carpals. You see that wrist, the wrist. This is an area like a knee for, if we're talking about like a dog, for example, they have like a, a front knee, right? You wouldn't call the dog's front arm, you wouldn't say that's their elbow, right? They have, they have four, what we would call knees, but we, we made that up, right? Technically, it's an elbow on their four limbs. And so again, you can see, and then the other thing too, just like look at the similarity between the dolphin and the seal and the human's hand. This is very similar to a human, but theirs is covered in a fin. So a little bit different. You don't see that structural difference. The other thing too, sheep are very unique and that their phalanges, the ends of their phalanges, imagine that you had to walk around on your hands. You'd probably do this, right? You wouldn't do this, because our phalanges are not strong enough to hold us like that. So eventually over time, what was favored in the sheep was that the phalanges started to have mutations where they morphed into one hoof. Same thing with like horses. And so it was easier for that pounding on the phalanges. There's other structures that are called vestigial structures. Sometimes people call them vestigial, however you want to say it. Vestigial structures show a relationship to something, a common ancestor over time, but currently in that species, they're not useful to their survival. They don't serve a purpose. So you might be going like, what, what is that thing? So let's talk about pelvic bones. If you're a whale, female whale, in evolution we have something called sexual selection, that what organisms do is they, the females generally, will choose the best male to mate with so that her offspring can have the best characteristics for survival in the future. So let's say we got a female whale and we've got two choices here. And one whale looks like that. And the other whale looks like that. So her choices are to choose this whale who does have hip bones, but what do hip bones support? Their legs, right? So. This one has hip bones, but it doesn't have legs anymore. It has evolved mutations that cause it to be what we call more hydrodynamic or streamlined so that it can swim through the water faster without dragging legs around. So the female is like, mm, this one is faster, can get food quicker, can get away from predators quicker, could guard my babies better. This one, I like his cute legs, they're cute, but this one is slow because the legs are kind of dragging. It's making them slower to swim. Also, predators could grab onto the legs 
and catch them. So she selects this one because it has the better characteristics for survival of her offspring. Now remember, they both do have hip bones, but this one had mutations where the hip bones don't have the legs connected anymore. In this one is what we would call the vestigial structure. What we know about them is that this whale was related, had a common ancestor with something that walked. Same thing with snakes. A lot of snakes will have hip bones, but they don't have legs. So you might look at the, the fossils of it and they say like, oh, they have these two little things internally. And, and some living snakes today, um, like boas and pythons, they still have like, there's some specimens that have been found with like little nubs of like, <laughs> of, like legs. Yeah. Of, like, of, and, um, and, and, and it's actually like a regular occurrence for snakes today to actually have like, um, to have like spurs where their legs used to be. I have a rosy okay. boa uh -huh. and um, he has like, he has like little spurs near um, where, where his tail starts and that's like the remnants of the legs. Oh, very cool. Yeah. Like, their embryos have legs too. I think snake embryos have. Pro I mean, I would hypothetically agree with you. So. And that's actually yeah. the, the cool thing about embryos is um, those, you can actually see like the um, an, an ancestral traits oh, that actually right. used yeah. to be like fully functioning in embryos. Like, like bird embryos, you can actually see um, you can actually see the teeth in bird embryos, and then the teeth like, the, and then they, they go away when the um, mm -hmm. the chick is fully developed, ready yes. to hatch. So that that's that's like how you could tell a lot about evolution through embryos. Yeah, so. yeah. Then what you're going to look at embryos today and see those similarities. I have a question. So for these vestigial structures, so I understand that they may have evolved from something that you know it had a pelvis at the time, so that's why it has it. It just doesn't need it anymore, but are there ever like vestigial structures that, you know, they don't serve any apparent purpose now, but they might have had that structure because it served a purpose at one point? Absolutely. And that is... The we see now doesn't need it? Yeah, absolutely. And that's kind of like the idea is that there was, they had a common ancestor with something that probably, well, something that did walk on land. So when their common ancestor was on land, it, it was good to have legs and hit bones on land because then you could walk faster. You could get away from your predators faster. You could get places faster. So yeah, absolutely. So it does go back to common ancestors. Yes, it does. It goes okay. back. So it does show evolutionary relationships. Okay. Um, so just as my uh, the hip bone example too, here's a boa constrictor, and it has the remnant of a hip bone, and yeah, perhaps like this part right here pushes like a little nub out of the skin, and the whales have that little hip bone, but if you look at a, all of these have a common ancestor with a vertebrate, someone who had a backbone, that salamanders do still have legs and the hip bone serves an important purpose for it, but for them, the hip bone is vestigial. So Our wisdom, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, so are they gonna keep those structures until they maybe get a mutation where it like kind of expels those, those genes that are gonna cause it to make those bones? Yeah, perhaps. You know, um, and perhaps the idea too is that there's a mutation that completely codes for those to not be there anymore. And that when we're talking about like sexual selection, that this one's even faster because it has less bones. Okay. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a question. Yeah. Um, our wisdom teeth, our vestigial structures, how many of you have less than four wisdom teeth? Oh, I see you're highly evolved. Yes, good, yeah. Um, I have four, so I'm just um, low on the evolutionary version. Mine aren't even like, even fully developed yet. Yeah, so they will, one day, they may, they may not, they may not, sometimes they don't ever come out. My husband's, um, his wisdom teeth didn't come out until he was 34. And he had to have surgery and it was hysterical. Um, <laughs> afterward. <laughs> but, it, what happens, the, the thing about why we get out our wisdom teeth, uh, why we have to, is that they begin pushing when they start coming out, just like when you were a baby and your teeth started to come out, right? Your teeth come out, but this one eventually like may come out. What it does is that there's no room. Our jaw got smaller over evolutionary time. Our jaw doesn't have room for this, but yet we still have this tooth here. 
which is quite a large tooth, and if it starts to come out, it could start pushing on all the other teeth, and it could wreck your bite. And then if your bite, if all your teeth are kind of like facing forward, then you're, you're gonna grind away your teeth. And we don't want that, so we get them taken out. So those of you who have less than four, it's great. Any of you have none? Oh, you have no, no wisdom teeth, all right. So you never have to have the wisdom teeth surgery. Thanks, thanks. Highly involved, very highly involved. Yes. So right, like could you imagine on if you're on a dating app, and you're like, I wanna know how many wisdom teeth you have. The less wisdom teeth, the hotter you are. That's what we should be like, that should be on your dating app as you're as humans. We can read out wisdom teeth. <laughs> it's just like, like if we followed kind of the laws of natural selection, we would be selecting for people who had no wisdom teeth. Because then they don't have to have that surgery. And any, it's a minor surgery, it's a procedure, Right, but things can go wrong. People can die from having anesthetic. So like, for example, you're the hottest one in the room because you have no wisdom teeth. So we just do things a little bit weird as humans. Our, um, our pancreas is also, uh, not our pancreas, oh my gosh. Appendix? Our appendix, we yeah. need our pancreas. Yeah, you gotta need your pancreas. Yeah. Um, our appendix is a vegetable structure. The appendix uh, is a remnant of like a pouch that when we used to eat, kind of anything when we were scavengers, that sometimes when, you, when we were eating, we would get like hair and bones and nails, things that are very difficult to digest would go into that pouch. And then there were like a lot of enzymes and acids that would try and break down and get energy from those. But again, how many of you are eating, like going out and getting that squirrel in the morning and just like ripping its head off and chewing it up? We don't do that anymore. So like saying if, if while, while you're eating, you need to get something that your body can break down, would it try to go through your appendix or is your appendix just done? Um, we have a little pouch. I, I, that's, a, that's a really good question that I don't know the answer to. I mean, hypothetically, I would say probably, but I, I don't know if we have the ability to do that in terms of our digestive. I don't know if our digestive system is sophisticated enough anymore to do that. Yeah, so good, good, good question. Didn't our appendix fall out of use originally because we started cooking our food instead of eating it raw? Yeah. Because yeah. because killing the food, kill, it, um, it, um, cooking the food like kills all the bacteria and stuff, and that's kind of what the appendix was for. So yeah, that's yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we cook our food, so we just decontaminate everything, so we don't need the appendix anymore. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Good point. Yeah. So us changing depends on where we live. Yeah. Our English situation with what in. Yeah. So I mean. Not only with hypothetically in terms of like those like when you look at species and this selection process is that typically the females are going to try and select for those that have the best characteristics in the environment they live in so it's yeah. only the bones that change it's like, anything anything because like yes uh, two days ago when you said like if i have blue hair and like my kids aren't gonna have blue hair that's something different from the outside, but I'm saying like it's only the bones that are changing. No, it could be like, for example, uh, like with hair, that um, if when when we like our our ancient ancestors had almost like furry bodies because they lived in colder climates, because they didn't have heat like we have, so females would likely select for the hairier the thicker, hairier males, because then her offspring will have thicker hair and fur so that they could stay warmer within their own body. So it could be any characteristic. It could be like the teeth, too. It could be any, or, well, the teeth are bones, brain, right? We talked about the brain size, that the more social connections that you have, the better your survival. So when we're talking about like our older ancestors, if there was someone who had a bigger, bigger brain and then they had more social connections, they might have more of a community to help them survive, help their offspring survive. So brain size is another one that's, they get, any structure goes through evolution. Yeah, good question. Is it true that if you're, like say your habitat is like spongy and your body just evolves like having more melanin? So, so, well, the population evolves, not like you evolve. But what would happen, for example, is that, um, you know, and this is another one in humans, like 
like a selection really should be wisdom teeth, the um, color of your skin, especially now in nowadays, melanin protects you from getting burnt and getting skin cancer. And so the more melanin is actually better. Is that what our society says? No, so stupid, right? So it should be like, I mean, dating apps should be like all people with much darker skin should be the ones that are getting all the dates. Well, actually, it actually depends on environment. So with the whole melanin thing, um, before humans um, started, you know, before we like moved from where we like originally were from, the rule was like if you, the closer you like live to the equator, like the darker. Right. Um, so like, should the, be. Yeah. So with, with humans, like yeah, the closer your ancestors like lived to the like equator, that's their darker your skin was. But actually, I watched a video where less melanin can actually help you depending on the environment you're in. Like um, people who have lighter skin who like live like farther like north, like people like in Europe have like lighter skin because actually um, what, what it actually helps you do, um, it helps you do um, with less melanin in your skin, it like absorbs like vitamin D. Mm -hmm. So actually if you live um, like farther north where it's less sunny, um, too much melanin can actually be a disadvantage because you are not getting like enough vitamin D absorption. So actually yeah. if, um, if you're actually living in like a colder climate with like less sun, it's actually better to have like less melanin in your skin. But if you're living in um, a, like a warmer or more tropical environment, it, it, the, um, the higher melanin actually is more useful. It is more of a Yeah, that's a great example. So that actually is why we have the skin color, the, the, the whole variation. Right. Right, yeah, that's a great example of like where. So at the equate, you know, so then again, the dating app might be a little different where you live. Yeah. Um, some, there are some structures that are similar, but they don't share, they, you know, like everything shares a common ancestor, but it's depending on the closer common ancestor. So like, for example, we have the vertebrate group who share a vertebrate common ancestor and the invertebrate group, they share an invertebrate common ancestor. So those two branches kind of split off. Like let's say uh, butterflies and dragonflies, they have wings, right? Birds and bats have wings, but are they closely related? They're kind of, I mean, you know, again, everything's related over time, but the bat, the butterfly and the dragonfly are more closely related to an invertebrate common ancestor and the bird and the bat are related to that common ancestor. And we know there's a big difference there too because what is the content of the wing as well? The birds and bats, they have the same structure as all vertebrates, the bone structure. When we're talking about the invertebrates, their wings are just a few cells thick. So very, very thin. Can't fit bones in there. So very different strategies of flying. What we call these structures, we call them analogous. Just like we use analogies. An analogy is to describe two things that are similar, but they are not the same. So they did not evolve. When you have structures like wings in different groups of animals, they did not evolve from a close common ancestor. So the evolution of the wings happened differently for both groups. Now here's the kind of a, like, this one is like a They are evolving, even though they're evolving kind of differently in different branches of an evolutionary, we'll talk about trees when we get into diversity of life. Even though they evolved kind of on different tree branches, their branches are kind of coming toward each other. So what we call this is we call this convergent evolution. They're actually kind of evolving toward the same common goal. So it's kind of like this way, as opposed to the vertebrates are going away from the common ancestor. So there's a lot of this, this one's like a, a, would they eventually merge into a similar species? Well, probably not, right? Because we have totally, they have totally different reproductive systems and structures, but they are converging, their trait is converging. So here again, the difference. This is, I always think that's mind blowing. Just a few cell thick is the wing. And then you have bones in there, feathers, thicker skin. Oh, 
quick. So here's a question. So the four limbs, arms, of the seal and the penguin, they have humerus, they have a humerus, they have phalanges, they have radius, ulna, all that stuff. What, between these two organisms, what would you call their forelimbs? Would you call that a homologous structure, a vestigial structure, or an analogous structure? Good, yeah, yeah, homologous. So they have similar insides, so that makes them coming from a more closer common ancestor. All right, so you're gonna look at embryos today. Embryologies, you've already mentioned, the they can be very similar early on, but as they grow into the adults, the genes start to code for much different traits. So development, what scientists will look at, what biologists will look at is like, what do they look like as an embryo? If the embryos look similar, it gives us an idea that they came from a very similar common ancestor. If the embryos look very different, then they came from a much further ancestor. So can you tell the difference? Can you pick out which one's the pig and which ones are the humans? Yeah, pretty easy, right? Like, as adults, we can tell the difference between vertebrate organisms, but if I didn't have these labeled, would it be much harder to determine which of, to label which ones are which, right? So we all, the lemur, which is um, an ancestor of monkeys, the pig and the human all look very similar. So that's what you're gonna look at in lab today. So the resemblance, the early resemblance, the embryonic resemblance gives you clues into how related organisms are. Biogeography, so the change, sorry, I don't think you got that. Biogeography, the changes in the tectonic plates or the movement of land masses over time and how that affects the organisms who live on those land masses. You mentioned just like the melanin in humans, right? We have a difference in geographic distribution and what has happened with humans over time. We definitely have with my example of the vertebrates that they became best suited to living in different environments. Like we talked about the iguanas, for example, that as land masses moved, some of them had characteristics to stay more in green environments, some in maybe environments where the leaves changed a little bit more or the leaf colors were just like oranges and greens and browns. You saw that modeled iguana and then the marine iguana who is better at living near the shore. So even though we don't feel it, the land masses are constantly in motion. Now, the motion that they're in is like, like less than what you can actually squeeze between your fingers. That's how fast they're moving. So it's not very fast, it's very, very slow. On occasion, we see the land masses move like earthquakes happen, and that's two land masses that have kind of shifted and caused a movement to happen. Or sometimes you have um, volcanoes there's a movement inside from the earth. If we go back 250 million years ago, there was one land mass and it was called Pangaea. All of the continents, so this isn't including any islands or smaller land masses than the continents, but you can see that all the land masses were really close together. Another 50 million years later, we have an upper land mass and kind of two lower land masses. You have Laurasia and Gondwana land. And then you go back 55 more million years, and now you can see the land masses are moving. One of the things that's you know, really interesting, especially if you look at South America and Africa, they fit together like a puzzle. So you can see that these two, where that connection had happened, because you could put them together like a big puzzle piece. And then, so now present day from 65 million years ago when the dinosaurs were around to here. Now the point of talking about this in biology is that when these started to move apart, let's say that there's a connection right here and you have a population who's living right here. 
at where that connection between South America and Africa happened, and then all of a sudden one day there's an earthquake and you're separated far enough that you can't interact with each other anymore. And then over time, those land masses keep slowly moving apart. You did have one population, but now as these move apart, the selection of nature is much different. Nature starts to become very different. So that if this starts to move a little bit further south and get a little bit colder than this, which is starting to move a little further north, your population has different just needs for temperature. When you're talking about natural selection, one of the things that I just want to point out is we do not use the term strong and weak. What is a strong characteristic? What is a weak characteristic? You just say, what is favored right now? It all depends where, where you are. Yeah, but we generally just try. I really want you to not use these words. So when you're like, oh, this was the strong character, this is the weak one. No, 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 no. Because the weak one could eventually become the strong one. So we don't use that. It's favored. Favored is the word you want to use. All right, and then this last thing, we're going to go just a little over is molecular biology has given us the ability to really place organisms. Like for example, if they were just by sight a long time ago going, yeah, uh, that bat and that butterfly are closely related. And then maybe eventually, I mean, eventually we did find out about this, but let's just say that what they did was start to run genes or the DNA through a machine and sequence the DNA. And they were like, oh, their sequences are much different. So we have a lot more concrete evidence where things live together in terms of the evolutionary scale or tree. So scientists will use things like amino acids. They'll use um, one that they have looked at in a lot of organisms is an amino acid called cytochrome C. I'm sorry, it's a protein. They looked at the sequences of amino acids in cytochrome C. And they found a lot of similarities between a lot of organisms, including like humans and bacteria. So that this particular protein has shown the case that everything has a common ancestor to a single celled organism. So this was an actual, a really significant study using biochemistry. They also can look at gene sequences. So they're sequencing whole genomes of organisms. Like the human genome is sequenced, do we understand all of it? No, we don't even understand like a fraction yet. But the goal is to understand what each section is and codes for so that the potential to maybe like cure diseases, for example. So big picture is related organisms share DNA because everything in evolution is based on DNA. DNA code for characteristics. Are your characteristics mutated in a good way, in a not so favorable way, or they don't really have a change on the way you live in your environment? When you have organisms that share a lot of similar DNA, like humans and chimpanzees, we're about 90 98.5% the same. Just 1.5% makes a big difference, doesn't it? But that tells us at least that we have a common ancestor, a close common ancestor, and we are related. Does that mean we evolved from a chimpanzee? No, we evolved from a common ancestor with a chimpanzee. So remember that. Here's a cytochrome C between a mouse and a human. Just if we look at 315 nucleotides in this particular protein, you can see that there's only 30 that differ. So only 10% are different between a human and a mouse out of 315 nucleotides. So about, we're only about 10% different. All right, a major trend in evolution is that what kind of forms give, to, give rise to what kind of forms? So what you wanna do is you wanna basically kind of read the sentence with larger forms give rise to smaller forms, smaller give rise to larger, Simple forms give rise to more complex, more complex give rise to simple, weaker give rise to stronger. 
which one's the best choice? A. Simple, the big picture. Simple, the complex. Because sometimes this happens, but sometimes that happens. And these are not hard, fast rules. But this definitely, 